But in China, everything is big. So it's huge. So it's not, it's not condensation, right? It's actually it's huge, large, like air. So this is something I would like to think about relationship um, to this. Um, I, I want to. I had just listed a series of islands. Um, I'm actually born in um, in Malaysia, the island of Borneo, and I pretty much grew up in the Manhattan Island. And now I live in Hong Kong Island. And I've been working a lot in the context of Taiwan Island. And it's actually it's been a dream for me to come to Ternife as an island because uh, when I would actually I apply for. Uh, Fernando's office when it used to be called AMP uh, when I was a student here, but uh, but I never heard anything back. So I, the reason I asked Fernando was like I wrote you a letter to an internship. He said uh, I think we split up by then. So I guess the, I, the idea is that um, we somehow split from our the main island to smaller parts. So this is sort of some kind of interesting things about this this relationship, uh, both a, a, a biographical and also a, as a method as well. One interesting the idea of the island is the fact that you, do, you have no relationship to the, to the parents. You're complete divorce, or you could say that somehow having your own autonomy. And that's something I'm kind of interested in idea. So I'm going to talk about um, um, several projects. Um, I'm going to talk about a series of some of the earlier projects, how I do with, you could ask, you could question about the aspect of nature or uh, sustainabilities and the issues that comes in across. Miniaturization, I always find as as um, as not a Western thought, but it's also a ch Chinese as well too. And like, you, do you know these ch Chinese scholar rocks? Very tiny. Yeah, the Chinese always like to bring the idea of nature into their home, right? And it's somewhat a violent act because the trees start to look like it's scaled down, and they, they look the bonsai trees. You start to realize that you could imagine you be underneath the tree, right? So. When I look at this image, I think this is an image of one I think Sir John Stones, kind of reflecting about idea of collecting the museum of buildings, building collecting building. Um, that's what seems to be a con right now talking about in China. It's like there's so much buildings, actually there's many empty buildings. Somewhat unlike this case, um, running out of batteries, <laughs> but in this case, I kind of somewhere thought about. How does possibly is the idea of miniaturizations of this? Um, so I'm going to show a couple projects that has to do with cultural projects and uh, artistic projects in a way that had to do with this, this similar um, idea of collecting. I'm going to show you a couple projects. Um, you know, the projects that stem from, from China to Italy to Hong Kong and to, um, to China and Beijing. When I was in, um, I spent one year in Italy, and uh, didn't, that was kind of the beginning of my practice. Uh, I was on a fellowship called the Rome Price Fellowship, and during that year, I was asked to do one project, my first installation project, and the only requirement they asked me to look at two things. Um, we have a sponsor. Every project you do, you always get a sponsor, uh, but the sponsor also wants to get their message across, sponsor, corporate sponsorship. So on, on this. Um, on this left, it's actually uh, water from Tibet. So that means that the idea of cleaning fresh water from 5,100 meters above the uh, sea level, you can get fresh water. Um, this is actually, um, Lancome has, has a, um, created sponsorships for this project. And the exhibition is called White. In Chinese, White by also means uh, blank, empty sheets. Blank paper. Do you think I need to recharge? Yeah. Maybe actually I could get. I have a power. Maybe this is a bigger power than this one. So, what 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 was it curious is, is about this exhibition was that the fact that Lancome is a European company, but they sponsored to make a, a makeup called Blank. Right. It's actually to turn your skin lighter. Um, I'm sure in, in this island, the idea of turning white is actually means that it's not something you want to do, right? You want to get tan. You want to be able to show your abilities that you know you, uh, you know you you have an um, ability just to show that you actually have leisure. Uh, in China, the, the aspect of leisure is that if you're dark, 
that means you're somehow become a farmer. And if you become lighter, because you you some sort of begin urbanized, or um, or that you don't work in the field. So this was the aspect of those, those two projects where it came about. And they asked me to think about something white, clean. So one of the things I was really inspired when I was in Italy was actually these tile floor. And, and these actually uh, are basically hexagons, but you, at some point you could actually see three-dimensionally. Right? So you could select, depending on what your point of perspective, you could say this is a top plane, these are the two side planes. Um, so this space, uh, the installation is about 200 meters square. Right? Just only that this part. So it probably is a bit larger than that. So the proposal is I thought, how could I actually make this, uh, have a discussion with the, uh, the sponsorships? So actually the piece I did was actually, um, when you go there, people didn't recognize this actually a work because actually you start to see reflection of other works. And this work is actually, uh, I don't know if you could guess what it is, material. Glass? Marmalade? Marble? Very close by. Um, uh, it's actually water. <coughs> because um, suddenly, um, it's really interesting. Um, um, in, in China, when you have an opening, you like invite a lot of movie stars. <laughs> yes. So they all come. So the audience is attracted by other people. So on the first day, uh, there were a man who was walking, basically walking, you know, looking at the work. But he wanted to test the work. You know, when you sometimes people like to touch things, like the scholar rocks, right? It's an art object, but people you have to touch it. But this person decided to step on it. <laughs> And so he was very upset. <laughs> Not the artist was upset. <laughs> he was upset because it ruined his shoes. And so what, what's interesting is that the, the moments when you start to uh, create this ability to have people interact with the work, either architecture or artwork, in this way is somehow, and I thought that was a, probably the success of it, was actually the fact that this person was very upset. And then he made a scene, so people just looked at him. And... Um, so this is sort of aspects of it, so you can see. Um, and also decide to make the water black, because if it's clear water, you don't get a good reflection. It would also say that the water is clean, but black, not white and clean. And this is a, a project, and I thought, um, Something I did this project is called a, called a mono room hotel. Um, this is for Artissima, and I noticed when I usually go to art fair, I cannot find a place to stay, and usually all the galleries are very empty. So um, I did this project called basically uh, both as an exhibition, but also a place you could stay. So um, it works as a um, exhibition as well as a hotel. So this is when. Um, this is when the exhibition is open. Uh, these are actually doors. So you basically enter the exhibition, you start to realize all these things are hidden behind. So you could rent it at night. So you could come back and you could stay overnight with the work. Uh, people always say, can we open this? I said, we cannot open after the gallery is closed. So there's always a negotiation where, where, where the front door is closed or and such. So you basically could stay overnight, and that was part of the ex work, is to, to test how much people really want to participate. Uh, we don't, because art fair usually sell things, but in this case, we just rent it. Right? This is, um, <coughs> this is, um, this is a, a very big island. Uh, this, is, uh, uh, this is China. Uh, ch China is called Zhongguo, it means uh, Middle Kingdom. And so, um, so the country is actually referred as the center. <laughs> no, it is not, it's not saying it's the name of somebody, but it's actually means it's a middle kingdom. So, which is a very interesting because uh, predominantly, this is all coastal land, and this is all inland. And so, I'm going to show basically a relationship um, about China and Hong Kong. And it, I don't know if you probably know the news, but the, uh, the relationship between Hong Kong, China, and also Taiwan to China is getting very fragile um, because um, 
China, I was just thinking that perhaps the idea of actually um, having more a brotherhood or a sisterhood to expand this relationship back to the center. Um, this is a project. Um, this is a project with an investigation about um, uh, a project, which is a uh, Hong Kong's oldest building. Can you imagine what is Hong Kong's oldest building? Usually in uh, Europe, you probably have church as the oldest building. Uh, Hong Kong, the oldest building is actually a prison, <laughs> and which which is a, a lot to say, right? You think that. Um, all everybody in Hong Kong decided the most important to build keep is actually the prison, right? <laughs> to show that this is real architecture. And but the, but the British was very clever. Actually, they made the prison uh, and the police station and the courthouse all together one block. So basically, you could get in, get out, or it's usually to stay in within a very short period of time. So the police station next door is the courthouse and such, and so this is a project was um, um, I thought it was in another in other words that this prison is actually right middle of Hong Kong. It's called the Old Bailey Street uh, um, Victoria Prison, and I thought could I use a material which is so small, but encompass the whole entire space of this prison yard. Uh, you can see that this is actually um, the urban wall, and this is the prison, and then. You can see that I'm trying to show something in here, but somehow it's being squeezed. This is a w one of the largest trees in the city. Um, kind of in, and uh, what's really interesting was that I did a little research about this tree, this two pair of tree. And I found this uh, old photograph, um, but why do you know I cannot see it? But it, actually, do you see this thing right here? It's a wall, it's a fence. And I was trying to figure out why they built a fence around the tree. Because it doesn't make sense people could climb up to climb out the prison, right? Doesn't make doesn't make a lot of sense. So what I found out was actually in the 1960s, a lot of people used to hung themselves uh, on this along this tree because you don't have anything that to restrain yourself. So it's actually um, it's interesting. Uh, because when I did this research, I decided to use um, these uh, rope. These are polyester ropes. Uh, you could, uh, it's about four millimeter thickness, and you could carry 200 kilo. It's just enough to get yourself out of prison. And I custom ordered this and worked with a uh, fashion designer, and to work on the colors. And so basically, I designed all the threads. That's another thing about in China here is that the fact that you could start everything from the beginning. You don't have to start from the end side. So we developed this and, uh, and ordered the string uh, 30 kilometers long. Uh, 30 kilometers, which is the distance between where the prison to China. So that's the distance. So a 30 kilometer long of thickness of, uh, of ropes. What the idea was is basically is to weave the urban wall in this, between the trees, but into the individual cell. So the installation basically you could sense that uh, what it looks like in the city, what it looks like in the courtyard, what it looks like in the in the prison room, and smaller and smaller. So the so it's basically get people to navigate around the threads. So you can see this is the prison wall. Uh, which is very funny. Hong Kong has um, there's too many administration. I don't know if in Spain it's the same case. Uh, they told me I could do an installation, but I cannot drill onto the wall. I cannot put a hole inside the wall. Um, so I asked the, um, the our director for the preservation program in Hong Kong U, who's the only preservation department in, in the universe in Hong Kong. I said this building is not that really important. It's about only 40 years old. But they treat it like it's 500 years old. And so what was interesting is that then it later did research about this. is actually this plan was interesting because they actually designed a panopticon. They had a guard house right in the middle. And the building actually shaped exactly what the installation did. And so what's just interesting to how to use these little projects to start to find out research, basically bring all the people um, 
you know, preservationists and also different people in a way to have a little discussions in the cases. So you can see that this uh, this threads I have to build a piece where it doesn't pull down the wall because we have to use a I have to engineer this because there's about 300 strings and it's actually tight and they were actually they were the the government was very worried I'm gonna pull down the wall because the fact that it's enough strength you could pull it and so we had to reduce everything but you could see that everything is designed going through but you can see all the string goes through inside the prison cell. And so then I had realized that um, it was very difficult to get these strings into the window because there's different uh, security systems to one trying to get people out. So now it's how to get the strings inside. So basically the process is actually weaving from the wall. It's all weaving back. Imagine how straining this is to do this. And once you get into the room, it creates a canopy, right? Suddenly you understand that the string very far away, you could understand that in a very smaller scale. It's kind of like con condensing that string that appeared, doesn't look like anything from the beginning, but then it starts to get smaller. And this is, um, this is a, was a very difficult task. Basically there's a four or five people bringing the string, very big guy <laughs> taking the string all well, one time. It's quite, quite amazing because, you know, Weaving is, is, it seems to be like a very domestic thing that you do, but you have this construction worker doing this, and I thought this is actually uh, quite interesting to think about. It actually, with this, they're not big, but they're just like a Chinese mafia. Right? They, they, they do this job, but they have another job too. So. <laughs> and um, so basically, um, um, the whole thing is that actually, this is the weight that we use to tie the string. Uh, work with a with a with a fashion designer to design the bag for the weight, so we we'll put sand inside. And so this is the whole entire structure. Um, there was a, there was this interesting test because um, because inside the prison, they said that you cannot have anything anything sharp. So there was a lot of negotiate between the public. What there's always somebody middle person think that you need to protect people more than the other, but sometimes. The problem in Hong Kong is that the fact that when you protect more, it becomes too like childlike in a way. Um, so what happens is that the question is like, I order all the string, 30 kilometers of strings, what am I going to do with them after I'm done? Because the installation lasts for four weeks. So I decided to, um, to take an abandoned building, which is going to be destroyed in four years, and weave it. And those, those, uh, those those, those controller that you saw actually now I transfer it, weld it together, use it as a weight. So we're just suspending within here. And so we're just using it, basically just using the same thing to inter interact. So people might say, oh, I remember this work um, several years ago at the prison because you cannot go inside the prison. And they say, ah, this works out here. So I thought, is it possible to use a small intervention to link up the memory of a place which is temporal? And this is more temporal, which is four years, to how to activate people's uh, relationship to it. People thought it was actually for laundries, for the clothes. But. Um, so, so I would like to work a, a lot of on uh, temporal aspect. This is the uh, the is this is the ambassador of Romania's house in Rome, and um, and I thought this is very funny because they had um, two entrances to the house, one at the higher level, one at the lower level. But the higher level was it's common, but the lower level is more formal, but it's never been used. But something I noticed that when you stand right in the middle of this door, you could see this two staircase that's wrapped around. It looks like it's actually one staircase, one steps. So I thought, I want to get to the point where you see, and you see two vertical lines in this garden. So I thought, what could I do to use this project? Um, in Rome, there's not many people ride bicycle. There's a lot of people who ride motorino. So I asked, um, so one of the things I thought, where am I going to get these bicycle lights? So I ordered 200 bicycle lights. And, um, and I ordered them, I installed the work. And then I decided I'm going to buy the batteries. I need 400 batteries to put it in. But so what I did was I actually installed the work along here. And this is funny because people thought this was the exit. 
to get out of the, the space. So they just follow me in. <laughs> and uh, and it, it came back up again. So I thought it was interesting that you have these live people thing as a, as a, as a light for a message. Um, but one of the things I thought in the whole process was the fact that um, I did this installation for three days, four nights, uh, because that's the duration of the battery's life. That's the life that the, 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 before the battery dies out. But you know, in here, everything looks the same, right? But when I install it, I noticed not all the light finish at the same time. Some light just finish, some light is not. So I thought interesting is that you install something and suddenly you realize that the battery is not the same. And this is something that was kind of interesting as in the well is that the fact that you know you, you think that certain thing looks equal, but it's actually not equal. And so this is something something that's sort of kind of in my memories and how I sort of think about how the world is kind of running through. Um, I moved to China. Well, I moved to China a couple of times. Um, the first time is after immediately after I graduated from um, from uh, architecture school, and the second time uh, I came back was because I was uh, invited to uh, to teach at Hong Kong University, and I applied and I, I got in. So, but then at the same time I was teaching in another school. It's called the China Academy of Arts, uh, because tech, most architecture school in China is, comes from engineering, and this particular school. It's very interesting because it's only from the art school. Uh, the person who became the, uh, the head of the school, his name is uh, Wang Shu, uh, is an architect uh, two years ago, uh, first Chinese architect who never left China um, to study or anything, but he uh, was dean of the school. And uh, he, ha he had a goal that he wants to make into a Chinese architecture school. He didn't say he wanted influence from any other places else, but so he started to bring a lot of interesting people in. He he required all the students to learn calligraphy in the beginning, and uh, and the school is amazing. Each each architecture year they have their own wood shop, so they have to learn how to do furniture joints. So the first year they have to they are taught by a furniture maker how to make joints so that it's not visible. <coughs> So one of the things I, I, I when I taught this course and I asked him, um, have you seen this movie called Lost in Translation? L like some of you said yes, um, but for them they say no. And I said it's impossible. How can I not lost seen Lost in Translation? But then I found out it's actually um, it was in Chinese. It's not called Lost in Translation. They changed the title, called it Lost in Tokyo. Because in Chinese language, you cannot lost in translation. Just like I was saying that inventions, you spelling, you miss, the fact that you cannot lose yourself in translation is politically not correct. But so they changed the movie to Lost in Tokyo. So for half an hour, we were just trying to figure out <laughs> what this movie was. And I thought, this is a perfect, perfect class to teach. Because that's the beginning. It's the fact that we always have an idea what the other world is, but we don't really know what the present is. So I taught them um, basically. If you uh, the the course is actually is to ask them to collect things. I, I don't want you to design. It's to collect. So I asked them if you could collect 1,000 objects that defines a city, image of a city. Um, but the, what's interesting is the fact that um, the uh, they all become they become a different lexicon. So this one student decided um, if tomato is a fruit or vegetables. And so, and then she um, built a diagram of model, which is one meter by one meter. So eventually, the thing that tastes like tomatoes, but it's not tomatoes. So it, it changes and changes. So I thought this is very interesting paints because uh, in Chinese language, you always the relationship about what does it mean. The original has to mean the same. So this is it tastes like tomatoes, but it's not tomatoes, or it may have the nutrient of tomatoes, but it's not tomatoes. So you can see that the you can see that becomes um, very natural, then become very artificial. And so I also and uh, this is very interesting. Um, in China, uh, when I came there, they always believe that you have to design a facade, a frontal facade, that shows a door and a staircase to lead up. So there's a there's a there's a code of thinking that you have to design this way. So this one student thought it's interesting is that you take the same object, you cut it, you just show it. Either a section or plan. 
And so this is the student gets very interesting because he started. Maybe we don't have to design like elevation. We should design like through section that looks like elevations. So he collects these objects. What's interesting is that he's, we have a discussion in here to think about what's, are we still dealing with the same issues, frontalities? You, know? you need to have four elevations for the buildings, but what happens if six? Or so it sort of comes about. So it's interesting to get the student to conceptualize the problem. How do you think about architecture? And I'll just show um, some code. Um, in China, they like to collect a lot of VIP cards. So for every store, they always give you a VIP card for discounts. So this student has lots of cards. <laughs> so basically, you cannot condense anymore. So it's just the fact that you expand. Uh, this was student was very interesting is that um, she speaks Japanese, and she collects a lot of stamp from Japan, but she never been to Japan. And so I thought this was kind of interesting to think about this. Imagine the impression, the, someone like the impression of Africa, that you think that there's animals with two heads or something, you know, Raymond Rousseau's um, talking about the, sort of the impressions. And it's halfway between dream and realities. And I thought the student was kind of in falling between that. Anyhow, I'm just going to show you. So these are all work. Uh, what's interesting with this one student is start to think about. Can we think about materiality, change of scales? Because uh, you know, aggregate is so small that you could develop concrete, but it's so large it becomes stonework. So that was a question the students kind of asked me. You know, what material should we still use? But basically, it's one one single materials. You break it down to scale and such. So he started to make uh, these works. Uh, this is one of the most difficult parts. He said, "Is can you smell the city?" And um, so the one student basic had to make how do you do drawings and documents. Basic, they had to document people's impression, how they would first react to it, in a, in a, in a way to think about um, images, um, which is non particular, non visual as well. Um, I work a lot also with, uh, with uh, people that I would never ever meet, ever. Uh, this is a man, he's actually the same age as me, and he lives in a Town, uh, north part, near kind of near North Korea, and he's a school teacher, and he teaches uh, he teaches to tear paper. And you know those you know those uh, paper cuts. Sometimes you have friends that go to China and they buy you gift, and this uh, you put something on the wall. He doesn't do it by cutting; he does it by tearing. And which is interesting because there's no document history how long this has been going on, because when people tear it and just burn it and they throw it. So there's no record history. So we did this project for one year, how to, uh, how to have this relationship. He basically, it was interesting, he teaches uh, very young kids between first grade and sixth grade. He said the first grade, the kids' hands are not developed, so they cannot tear. So when they get to second, third, and fourth, they're better. But once they get to fifth and sixth, they don't do this anymore because they have to take examination to get into the next school to junior high school. So they don't do this anymore. So they have to go stick, they have to start to study. So what's interesting, he says that, and he does this amazingly, and I'll show you, this is what the, the, he does. He tears this by paper. Right? And I, I could show you some of them. He, some of them are incredible. Some are just, they're structural, because basically, you cannot glue them together. Right? It's all structure, it's one sheet of paper. In this case, it's actually several sheets. And he does his tear. He doesn't draw first, he just tears. And some of them, he can even write stories behind it. And some of them, he tears so much, it becomes painful even trying to do it yourself. Right? He does this every day to exercise, to train. And, um, and so this is what something we, we did together. We decided, how do we exhibit the work? And so we decided to do a project called a self-educational school. So basically, you, get, you build a big table, which is 10 meter by five meter table out of paper and with wood. And basically the students will go in and come out and they will just learn from what other person did before and just tear. And so once they uh, once they uh, finish the pieces, they go underneath the table and the lights hit, it becomes like, uh, like a shadow puppet of theaters. So this is some way to how to create a program. Say we, we want to create a program thinking schools that you know but is no teacher. Right, just independent structures. 
So this is what first part is where it came in. And so this is what I mentioned about his work. He does figures, and then these are their Chinese characters, his stories. And there's only a few people in China that does that. And mainly because we're doing this project, how, how to get somebody who, like myself, a teacher at the university, I don't get to meet this person at all. So we decided to spend one, one period of time as a project for one year to develop. What, type, what can I learn from him, what he can learn from me. And this is something that's very important in relationship because, um, because people like him, he could either work in the factory, right, in the city and lose his, lose his history or he could actually continue working on this. But, um, you know, um, this is something he's trying to, it's really funny because um, he's trying to sell his work. Uh, he teach one town, uh, he, he take all his work to the next town to sell on the street. Because he doesn't want his student to see him that he's selling this on the street. <laughs> My teacher is selling something on the street. So this is something I thought was quite interesting. Um, I've been working on some uh, some current public art project in, in China, and which is an interesting process. Because public art um, in China, meaning that you have to tell a message. Um, if you don't have a message to tell, and usually it's it's highly propaganda, and so this is something that we developed projects. Um, they gave us a pro they gave us so we figure uh, they asked us they we saw so many projects. Some is like a love story from uh, the Song Dynasty, or maybe something you know lyrical. But it's the it's all the same story, but just different versions in the public arts. Uh, so we did this project where it basically is um, the site is actually 20 meters long. They gave us. But they told us that you could go in and out only 20 centimeters. So we thought, what can we really do? So we, we decided to call the project uh, 1% because that's the, the, that's the increments between the length and actually the dimension. So we actually developed projects. <laughs> Basically, um, this, this station is next to CCTV is where the Rampuhas building is. And so during the daytime, there's many people coming out. At night, it's probably empty. And so we're thinking about this relationship. How do you look at yourself every day? And you go into the station, basically you see yourself there. But then you see all your friends are actually, they're walking very fast. So it looks like their feet is walking very forward and split. Or they walk very, if they think too hard, they might feel like the body is moving forward and the feet split. So this is, you can see that the body changes. And we've been working for us so many times. And, we, and, um, and the officials got so upset. They said, we're going to ban the use of glass for, project, for any public art project. So now we're negotiating with them, trying to see how much can we push to do public art still quite in a way common. The work in Chinese public means common. It's, there's no this word. It's actually it's common that we all share. So we've been testing up mock-ups for this project. So you can see that his feet is there, but his body is in his friend's foot or so. So the, the idea is that how do you how do you develop this project, which is low tech, right? But just how did it play with this with the ideas of geometry that given started with a rule and how do we play it into a aesthetic size? Uh, we didn't want to use um, clear glass because then it, would think it looks it looks like just like the same room. It's actually typical very bad lighting, fluorescent lighting. We want to make the room slightly warmer, so we tried to play with different type of color glass to change the space of it, so it actually illuminates something warmer. But of course, they always kind of ask us to change. So we we, we developed many schemes. Um, difficult these projects, they work very fast. Usually, they give you like three weeks to develop it, and then two months to make a mock-up. And they could decide they don't like it, and they ask you to do another new design in one, one, one week. We, we work like that. Um, basically, our studios, uh, um, um, mostly some students, a lot of uh, interns from Japan. Um, and so basically, we work like a speedboat. We don't work. Hong Kong office is like a cruise ship, it's huge. Minimum 1,000, well, maybe 500, like 200, 100 office. 
all our students who graduate do very artistic work, but they work in these big offices for life. So <clears throat> thinking about in, in Hong Kong, we need to have something smaller to scale so that you start to have a more discussion with the public and the commons. So we work like a speedboat. Basically, we go very fast, we turn very fast. That means we could change things quite quickly. So these are the different schemes. <clears throat> um, one, of the, one, of the, one of the projects, um, I start to realize that um, if I continue to work as an architect, it's going to be very difficult because the, the infrastructure is, doesn't set up for what I want to do. So one of the things I th thinking was direction was like, could I go into the idea of exhibiting architecture, curating architecture, in a sense. So this is something that I'm trying to develop only the last two, one year. So I'm currently working on three curatorial projects. One's for a museum. Uh, this one is current on show. Uh, one's with public art. Um, and then another one is actually another project I'll show you later. It's the world's smallest museum. And this, this project um, um, was actually is for the birthday of Taiwan. And the birthday of Taiwan, uh, Taiwan, sorry, became in the, uh, as identified as a city, was actually the same day, same year, 1884, basically 130 years ago. This is the first uh, skyscraper in the world. It was called the Home Insurance Building. And um, it was complete in 1884. And uh, we thought it's interesting to mark because Taipei has also the world's tallest, or well, used to be one at some point. Uh, it's the Taipei 101, very tall tower. But there's only one tower there. There's no any other tower. So we thought this is interesting to talk about Taiwan in that case. Um, the cause of unknowing was actually um, um, was a was a uh, was a book written in the 14th century, but we don't know who wrote it. It was probably a monk wrote it and distributed it, but n nobody knows who the original author is. So we're interested in the idea that can we develop a project where we don't really know who the original author is. So we invited 26 architects, 25. Um, we, one of the proposals that they have to do new projects. And we, we also choose an architect who's quite well known, but also we don't know what, who did what. And so this is a proposition. Um, strangely, is that the, the, this is what the museum plan looks like. It actually looks like a street. It looks like a building by Izuzaki. Uh, was actually this is probably a copy, copy version of the Metabolus building, but this is actually what the plan looks like. It's on the third floor, and when you get inside, everything looks the same. But how can you change the characteristics of that? So this is a project I'll just go through. Um, um, when, when we introduced this project to all the art, uh, um, the um, the exhibitor, they were very confused. Like, why do you use this? Why do you use this thing called clouds of unknowing? A city with seven streets. So the first, for the first project was actually we work with sound artists. Uh, typically, when you do an architecture exhibition, uh, problem is that you have architecture models, drawings of the models, a site plans, maybe some mock-up materials, right? Um, but sometimes it doesn't really tell you how you exhibit architecture, and so this is something that we were trying to play with. Um, how to install it so in the way that you get a different sense of what architecture is. So um, and so it becomes also a political statement as well too. In the art museum, how can you still do architecture exhibition? So this was the first architecture theme exhibition. Previously they had uh, Glenn Merkett, uh, Le Corbusier, Louis Kahn, but these are all architects show that's traveled from, from one place to another. And so I, I have figured this, sh this show can never travel because it only can fit into this museum. So the first part we actually did call it uh, by a composer called Clouds of Sound. So basically it's 100 speakers. When you enter, suddenly you f flood with different uh, mimicking of uh, uh, actually uh, vocal sounds that has been edited through uh, mixers and such. So the first impression is that you, your, your state of mind has changed. Right? Um, and this one was for a, 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 an architect who had passed away. And this is something that we, how do, how do you, this is the only architect that we have chosen was an architect that's it's not living. So basically we just collect his archive and curating uh, through the process. Um, 
seven we were so popular that people would just uh, because Beijing gets uh, Taiwan gets so hot during summer, so people usually come here and sleep here. Now this is a very popular spot. Uh, we just did the installation work with um, this uh, curator named Owning, um, and and basically he decided he no longer wants to work in the city anymore. He lives in the village, and he has a, one of the most impressive uh, bookstore. It's called the Avant Garde Bookstores, and so they bring all the literature, literary and such, into this area. And mostly, we're trying to do the similar thing like what we did with the uh, paper cutter, is to bring somebody who never, they bring a, uh, a textile weaver, one of the most uh, uh, well-known Chinese fashion designer to work together. And they do it for these projects. And in a way, this time I was basically saying that, the, well, migrant worker, you don't need to go into the city. You could stay here, and you could still develop an, uh, one place an entity. So this is a very important issues right now in the uh, discussions. I'll just show these different projects. Um, th this this artist, basic, uh, architect, actually he weaves all the uh, all the uh, existing uh, buildings and basically burns them, and so that you only left left with the remnants. And uh, and this is interesting. This is um, um, not particularly this work, but this architect, uh, he graduated from architecture school, and he decided he doesn't want to work for an architecture office. He is going to work by himself, and he only worked for architecture for the dead. In Chinese, you know this thing that you burn? You build a house, you burn them. You say that your afterlife, you're going to be good because you have a house. If you're a fisherman, they build a boat with paper, and they burn them. And so. His client is only for people who are dead, and they're very high-end client. Ask him to design house for for the afterlife, and he has a long waiting list. And so, so um, we thought this young guy, you know, is in his thirties. He decided that he doesn't want to work in the architecture field for the for the the living. So he could just autonomy. In the end, like we all do, we build models. If we get built. We say it's built, but if we don't build it, we call it projects. But all his projects is built, <laughs> right? Because we understand that's the scale, the miniaturization of the scales that he's building. Uh, we have a um, uh, um, uh, Fujimori from uh, Japan. We did a uh, investigation about the Rojo Society. Basically, it was a group of Japanese uh, writers and architects. They went to investigate how Tokyo has changed because um, because it's gone through modernizations. There's a lot of new Western building comes in. They were trying to document things that actually change between the extreme change and the no change. So they did a project with us in Taipei together. Uh, this was done by a very uh, young architect. Young? I was saying young. Um, it's a very interesting. Uh, he works in the north part of Japan. And he in this village right here, there's many interns comes from Europe, and they, but there's only one hotel. Which is owned by grandmother, and one Seven Eleven, nothing. <laughs> and so he's one of the most important Japanese architects, but he decided he didn't want to go to Tokyo. He just said, "I will just stay in my town and work." And so people right now is getting the very exciting architect, but he decided I don't need to go to the city. I could still be in this town and work. So he's also the same uh, region as uh, So Fujimoto, who decided to move to uh, Tokyo, but he. Uh, Juni Garashi decided to stay there, and what's interesting that he sort of maintained his own language that uh, that he, he would change if he actually go to the city. Uh, this is the work with uh, Go Hasegawa, uh, young Japanese architect. He's one of the only the first architect that only teaches outside of Japan. He teaches in a school called Mendrisio in Switzerland. So, which is interesting is one architect would never leaves. This one architect only teaches outside. Right? So uh, what's interesting about this part is actually um, if you get closer, it becomes dark. But once you go farther apart, it actually becomes lighter. It has to play with their perspective. Because the panel of this is actually in the, in the back part. Everything is flat, but in the back is wider. So when you get closer, your eyes to focus on only smaller things. Farther, not closer. Um, this is a very funny project. Um, I don't know if you know this thing. It's the, um, the group of um, uh, North Korean artists imagine what China is going to be like. It, they call it the beautiful future. 
And so these Korean, North Korean artists, basically, what's interesting that we found a little research about them, there are about 3,000 artists working in this village. And they produce sculptures, monument for Africa. So they do a lot of work for dict uh, well, dictatorial uh, uh, countries. They need to have a monument because no other country will build for them. So they actually, one of the largest exports in North Korea is to build these sculptures, bronze sculptures, somewhere in Eastern Europe and such. So basically, this is the work that we've uh, we shown up here. It's actually imagine what China's would be for people who've never been there. So they even gave us a rocket as well. <coughs> um, this is a project with Fukushima. Uh, this is a project um, in Japan. You probably know a lot of Japanese architects. When they build models, it's all completely white, right? This is a very strong aesthetic. Uh, this architect was a, used to work for Sana uh, for uh, about six years. And so this is actually the same model, white one and the color. Because this is a it's near it's a village near the uh, Fukushima where the major uh, disaster happened. And so this actually doesn't exist anymore. So they actually built the exact model. They asked the people to think about what the memory of that place. So basically, there's a lot of tags people put in. They said that um, what's interesting is that you kind of I was I, I don't speak Japanese, but I was asking what does it mean? What does it mean? I said. Oh, when the, when the disaster happened, I was here and I met four people and they wrote a description. And they said this and this. So they, have, uh, they said, when I was a little child 80 years ago and I used to remember this area. So basically, they don't have any photographs because everything is gone, swipe out. They don't have any record memories. So they go back to only use the models to imagine what it feel, reads the whole entire village. So this project was a very interesting accident because at the end, we don't know who the author is, but how do we collectively build up? So that's why the model has different color. We start to code the colors. Well, we actually they did, but it's how to code the colors based on the descriptions. So the model actually looks like there's a lot of information, a lot of people's memory, but it's all within, kept within here. Um, you guys probably have Facebook, right? <laughs> so we, went, we found one artist in the Facebook. Uh, we, we don't know. It's a, an, as, an, as, a, as an architect who studied, and then later went to ETH and studied, and then and, uh, he's been doing these drawings about himself, what he would be like 40 years later. <laughs> and basically, he's also drawing what Taiwan, Taipei, a lot of things are disappearing. So he's drawing things from the past to the present. And he called himself Uncle Architecture. And he, he, I don't wish I have a picture. It's shown that he's bald, hairy face, and he's still working in the same office that he started. And so he, uh, at night, he drew this. And so the curator that I worked together, he said that he found him on Facebook. He's like, who is this, who's this person? But he have all these drawings that we don't know. So something in here, the, the fact that how do we bring certain people? Certain people have never had exhibition before. They're like, why did you choose me? So I think that's probably exciting. It's like, how can you, how much can you test exhibit architecture in case that you, you have confidence of people and the certain ones you just don't know. Uh, this is an, um, I was also asked to choose. Can you choose one architect from Hong Kong? I said um, I would choose maybe one artist that talks about architecture. And uh, this is a series of projects that he's doing. Is it? Uh, he was. Very a pretty well-known artist, but all his work is all about the city, meeting strangers, and um, some of his projects uh, has to do with encounter. How can you become stranger become your best friend within two minutes? That's his projects, and so he did this projects. Um, I don't know if you have here, but most of the maps mostly in the poster, right? It's not in the book. So this one, he's always trying to figure out what happened inside the book. Right? When you open the book, if you live on the street, what happened to you? Right? So his project is always walking along the street between the two gaps. And so he found this book is like the fact that he's connecting one book to another book, so he's building up. So all his projects is always trying to find out what happened in, the, in these places. And what's interesting, he also decided to photograph himself in the middle, and all his book is opens right in the middle. So you, you have, if you have to see him, you have to 
pull the book out to see in the middle. Um, this is a you might know is um, as an architect. His name is Jiang Ho Chen. He's probably the probably the most well-known Chinese architects. Um, but we didn't want to show any of his buildings. Um, so we decided. Uh, so what do you do with anything besides architecture? And I know that he was writing novels. So, but he, then he later told me he's also doing uh, comic novels. So we decided to choose an architect um, pretty well known, but we don't show the architecture work. Just find out something outside. And this is something very common also in Asia, in Taiwan, uh, because the architects also serve many roles artistically. I'm just going to show. This is also an interesting about. Um, happened with something with modernity. Uh, this man, he's actually, when he was 15 years old, he had one job that he was going to do for life. He was very good at doing paintings. So he does. He is a painter for mural, like for movies. If you have a movie coming out, he actually watched the movie and he paints what the movie is like. So to get you excited to go see the movies, so it's the advertisement. So at some period. This modernity has changed, left him out with no work. Basically, he cannot, he basically, everything is in Photoshop, everything is digital. So his work, like he has no work now, right? So he decided, I'm just become, I will just continue to do the same thing. I'll just become, I'll just paint and draw. So he makes these sculptures <laughs> of figures. And how we met this person was, uh, uh, was actually the co-curator who worked there. He said that he went to a party. It was a wedding party. And uh, it in, in Taiwan, there's this thing called a love hotel. Right? I don't know you know what it is, right? Basically, you rent it by the hours. Right? <laughs> and so it's very popular there. And so what happens is that so this couple, they decided um, to have a uh, wedding party to say, let's rent the whole entire place and just have a party there. So they the man decided to run naked. And then uh, suddenly, all the beautiful women all surrounded this one section. And they were trying to figure out, what's going on? How come they are all focused on the And this person is not, it's not a sexy model. Right? He's just there. It's the same artist standing there. He's telling fortune to people. So he's a fortune teller. So he lost his job, so he became a fortune teller, and then he started to produce these works. And now his work is, uh, what's interesting is that you cannot even purchase the work anymore, because it's gotten to a point where it becomes a different figures now. And how it's continue. Um, <laughs> this was another work we also commissioned. It's called, it's, they call themselves the interbreeding groups. Um, each year, the student, they graduate, they don't, they don't say what year you graduate. They say basically your first generation, second generation, third generation. So in order to graduate from his school, you need to have, yeah, need to do two projects. So this is one project we did. It's <laughs> very large scale. And the only thing they do is that they don't do drawings when they build structures. They don't build structures and they don't do drawings. So you never know how big the whole project will be. So when we did the project, we just say, we calculate how much wood, how much weight it is, use this, cannot use any more. Right? And they only work at night. They will start at 6 p.m. and work until the morning. And they will blast it with music, and they will do this installation, building, building, and building, without any, any series of drawings. OK, well, I think it's reaching to a point. <laughs> I want to talk to you about this, uh, this last project. I, I do a lot of cultural projects. And one of the projects I did recently is, uh, is this project called the Miniature Museum. Uh, if you look at it, you probably know China is building a lot of museum, right? You've seen a lot of times. Sometimes you also forget which museum is which. Uh, in China, the, the government had a proposal to, thinking about producing, I don't know, is a ten, five year or 10 year policy to produce 40. 43,000 built museums. So it's about 400 mu museums a year, <laughs> more or less, right? 400 museum, museums. I mean, big museums, right? 
but most of the time, these museums, after a while, they're empty. And which is interesting is that the fact they build larger buildings, but they use a museum, but they use it as a something else when they finish, like a convention center, parties. Or so. so they use it. So it's a very multifunctional building, but there's still museum. There's museum for uh, ethnography, natural history museum. Every city has their own kind of different museums. So I thought, I thought I want to do another museum. <laughs> and I was thinking I want to get into this idea. You know, many different views. Some say it's 100, 400. But this was the pavilion that the Expo for China. It changed you into a museum. So basically, if you don't have, you cannot figure what to do. Just call it a museum. Right? That's that's kind of the instrumental part. So. When this project came in, it was basically um, they asked me to design a a, a wall, advertisement wall, just to say, oh, this is the museum. Actually, the project I asked me to design is to show the other museum, <laughs> right, as a sign. And it's designed by a very well-known Chinese architect uh, called Chui Kai. He's the he's kind of equivalent to like Norman Foster, like that position. He decided who goes to Venice Biennale. Who gets their bird nest by Herzog de Moron? He decided things, so I had to work with him, <laughs> and which is which is quite interesting. So when they asked me to design, they said, "Could you do something a facade pattern, just to you know, so that it's visually exciting?" I said, um, "But yeah, but if I do one hurt design, I don't even know which one looks good." So I said, "It doesn't work." So I asked them, uh, "How wide is the thickness of this wall?" They said, two meters." So I said, okay, I'll come back, give you an idea. So this is what I drew up. I built a wall, and I cut it out and said, this is the project. And so at first they were still very puzzled because they're saying, uh, why do you want to build a space inside? Who's going to go there? What do you do? So this was originally about a two-month project. It extended over... Uh, one and a half year, and the double the budget went six times over. So, but but funny that clients still got excited in this project, and I thought those abilities how you can get the architects also become the curator in this case. So we thought inside this little space we could have various different type of installation work. Uh, we we did different models. Uh, in China, sometimes. The, the, the dimension, everything is correct. So, so usually we design everything, and everything we, last minute we change, revert this. This was be something that we had to go up. So we work with a, a acoustic engineer, a composer, to develop this building. Uh, we did different mock-ups. The museum is called Inside Out Art Museum. Oh, so this is actually eventually this is a section of the building. So basically, this is not a flat ground. Oh, so it actually works as an instrument, musical instrument. And one other proposition, because I um, uh, been working with a composer, uh, his name is Ken Ueno. Is a he, he's non-traditional composer. He only worked with vocal, one sound but different tones. And uh, he's a professor at UC Berkeley. And we've been working together. And we talk about what's the relationship between composer and architecture. And we always talked about it, and he said that you know sometimes when I compose a one-year project, I think about a couple moments what what the what the viewer should remember from my music, not the whole thing, just a couple of them. So I said I want to do kind of similar same thing. So I describe five moments that you could remember inside the space. So like I said, it's not very big, right? See here, it's all poor concrete. And it's all one C2. And um, I'll show. Um, I, I knew this when the building's finished. <laughs> and I start to get worried. What do I do with it? <laughs> so I decided to say, why not I just actually call uh, myself as curator. When the project is done, I will take over the project for three years. And I will curate the program for the next couple years. And so w something about China is that you have a new museum, the biggest Party is actually this. No pun intended. Parties and parties, and so you celebrate, and afterward they don't you really care what the building do with it, right? So this basically in China, there's no curators. <laughs> there's a lot of architects, but no curators. So you get an event, and then I said, okay, I, the one important role is I'm going to call my all these project 
grand opening projects. So every project work that develops a, is an opening. Mock up some constructions. Of course, uh, we, we uh, a lot of time I also like to, don't prefer to draw too much, so we just work work with the character of the of the constructors <laughs> because at the general time there are a lot of them are very very interesting characters. So I'm using this part of my record of history. So basically, we did a mole. We're trying to figure out when you build this mole, how do you take this out? And so this is the steel work. So we just so this is the whole thing. We just cast one piece and both the exterior and interior together. So basically, you could listen to the building through this vocal points, and we have this double, uh, this double curvature. So we we told the construction worker, we didn't know how to draw. It's like, uh, it's like a, it's like your mouth when you, that. I just told them, can we develop something like that with the concrete? Because every concrete always one little bit getting so chubbier <laughs> when we shrink it. And um, so when we did this whole process, it was very interesting um, what, what the effect story came out of it. So in, in this case, we, so now, now I'm working. Now I also found out recently somebody told me they also have the world's smallest museum. It's in Switzerland. So during this trip, I'm going to go and meet with him, trying to figure out how small his museum is. And so I, then we talk about collaboration. His, um, the museum is called Kunsthalle Massor Duchamp. It's in this town in Switzerland. And uh, it, it's been having a lot of major projects there. <laughs> and they're thinking, why don't we collaborate? Can we have the world's smallest museum inside the miniature museum? And a way to start to have more discussion about this project. So in other words, when architecture develops, so how to keep the conversation going? But of course, um, all of these things are, I have to figure out how to do this. Basically, I have to figure out how to fund these projects. And that's, that's another interesting part about it, how to get people excited to continue the project going on. Um, because, uh, because everybody at the board of this museum said, why are we doing this? <laughs> we have big museum. Why don't we use that space to do many things? So this is an interesting point, And it's gotten a lot of interesting attention, because the first project we did with the composer on sound, um, we're going to uh, an artist called Manfred Binati, a landscape architect called Bas Smets in Brussels. Uh, we're talking with Tomar Saracino, who did a lot of inflatable works. We're going to talk about how you build, build up air, how do you represent air. And uh, Los Compinteros is an artist group, I think down the base in Madrid. <laughs> they actually disguise themselves as artists, but as a carpenters. So, so in this in this case of projects, that's the fact that. The first project, we, you cannot go inside the museum, you just hear it. So it's every Saturday from 5 o'clock to 6 o'clock, you have the sound work happening. And so what you, what you get is actually you get people excited, so you people never get closer to the museum, but they still that the, they understand that the museum is an instrument in these cases. Anyhow, uh, thank you very much. Sorry for a long lecture, but um, so I was going to say, think about this thing is that question of, of, of the sustainability is actually all practice is sustainable. Sustainabilities. Not once the project is dirt, we still go back and you know, kind of nurture the project and nurture this process. And this happened to a lot of our projects. Uh, we also try to learn uh, projects that we don't really get to meet people and how to start establish them. Like a, we made a big table. In a way, it's hard to develop these relationships. Uh, I, uh, something I realized that we cannot rely on larger structures. And how can we? Kind of keep within the miniature scales that we could develop, but having influence to have a larger discussion about museum, but building a small museum, but larger discussion, and to get people ex discuss. We got our project rejected, but we're still trying to improve it. So in how to think about public arts in the larger realms, but uh, certainly not because this is a country that has to learn a lot. It's something that we, I personally, would think we have to learn a lot ourselves. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay. I think this is a discussion series now. I think uh, uh, 
what all the time that I listen to you, I you open my mind really to see something that I don't can see, but you in the new parts. I don't know if you have the same the same feeling. Uh, I think we can ask to him something about China and museums. So really know not only China, he really know all the world. Uh, he has a lot of friends in a lot of part of the world. <laughs> 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 and I think it's one opportunity of go to him something. something. Uh, hello, can you um, tell us, uh, us how is to live in Hong Kong? Mm. Diary because you are the space is very very small. You told me no. There is a lot of green spaces, and, but you are a lot of people. Yeah. <coughs> uh, one of the things that you probably realize that Hong Kong is actually not very large, and uh, there's about eight million people. And um, but there's also a lot of green space. I think it was approximately seventy percent of eighty percent is still unoccupied. <laughs> so you imagine, so there's no suburbs, <laughs> and so everything is concentrated. So uh, they develop this uh, the cities in a way that is also to control the property prices. So they all develop, um, and also um, I'm working project with a, a public agency um, is still a confidential project, uh, but they are kind of the major developer uh, as, a, as a public transit, but they're a major developer of, uh, of uh, real estate. Um, now to a point where they're even giving advice to Germany how to, you know, how to make your railway much more uh, uh, sustainable. So what's interesting is that a small place like Hong Kong uh, is really a place where you trade things. Basically, Hong Kong is a mentality: is whatever gets in, I I don't keep, I just get out again. So it's a it's a very interesting um, uh, um, uh, thinking process. Um, that also creates a lot of problem because um, because the students are too clever <laughs> that <laughs> you get things out something I don't need I don't need to care so they're very strategic in a way so somehow it's incredible that learning from this uh, in Hong Kong is that um, it's um it's um it definitely in a position because um it's become become a place where decided um, it used to be a manufacturing but now it went to China. And so the, one of the things they the government decided to have a certain policy, they have to figure out we can no longer manufacture, we cannot rely on too much on banking, we need to have other type of industries. So creative industry is something they're really putting into. So basically every year they always invite each country to develop projects. Now the Hong Kong Art Basel is also a fear in fear trading. Um, what's interesting is that in Hong Kong, if you're an artist, one artist, if you're a pretty good artist, you work with many different galleries, and most places you could only work with one. And so the fact that uh, there is um, there's an influence of uh, of this creativity is coming in, but um, but somehow they st still put a little learn because the mentality is still running in and out trading policies. Um, but in terms of um, the space, is the fact it's very condensed. Um, I know that. Uh, you know, both of you guys when it came to Hong Kong, uh, it's really incredibilities. Uh, people always think that it's, it's a most like a, a transit hub, but I think I think there's still an incredible culture that needs to be developed in Hong Kong. Um, right now, uh, I noticed that um, right now, um, if you say maybe 20 years ago, there was a lot of British, and there was a lot of Austrian, Australian, but now there's a lot of Italian, Spanish. Working in Hong Kong, it's a huge, huge influx in here, and also a lot of French as well too. So, which is which is what I find interesting is that the fact that if you go to Hong Kong, I said it was a British colony, but you go there. I live in an area called Wan Chai. It's, it's all French. It's, <laughs> the crabs, you know. So it's, 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 and then one place is that you could change this. Um, I think the fact that it's uh, Hong Kong is hard to keep its identity because it's constantly changing quite, quite, quite a bit. Yeah, there's always a word they use, culture. I don't know if here the word culture they use, but it's a common word very used, but nobody really knows exactly what that means. Okay. Mm. 
I hope that answers your questions. Uh, first, congratulations, because I think uh, you have a special sensitivity to do for your work, uh, like a lot. And I would like to know uh, what, uh, what are your reference uh, in, uh, for your work? Uh, you have because you have been working around the world in Europe. You are in China. In China, and what is your, what are your reference? Yeah, th this is a interesting uh, question because um, um, wh where where do we come from? <laughs> cases and I and I always say that it doesn't. It's not demographic. It's not geographically. My belief now, which I my my, my belief is that. Um, it doesn't mean I live in Hong Kong. I should be a Hong Kong artist or Hong Kong something, or uh, uh, because I was um, born in Malaysia and I grew up in California, grew up in New York. So every time I place, people we ask me where do you come from. <laughs> this is a very interesting question. I don't know how when to answer. So usually um, it means that you have multiple histories. Um, which is an interesting question. I could. I don't know if I if I ask anybody here. Do you live in the same house that your grandfather grew up in? Not really, right? So I think this idea of um, we've I've been when we work on this project, the Taiwan project called Clouds Knowing, we were interested in looking at the history of Genghis Khan and uh, looking at the fact that um, Genghis Khan, he basically when you occupy a place. You don't leave anything behind. You just continue, and and it's a very different mentality as a farmer, right? Because you have the land, you cultivate land, you have to breed in. Um, but but not to say this is a contemporary nomad where you she live one place another place. Um, so one thing, one important core is actually you figure out where actually your relationship to what peers. Um, I've been finding more. Uh, younger people, I'm quite inspired with. By, um, I mean, also a lot of people actually decide not to do architecture, um, but then there are also a lot of people who decide to do certain ways of certain things. Um, <clears throat> I'm definitely, uh, uh, been, I'm actually working on a project looking at Otto Rossi, um, and uh, definitely some influence like uh, Kazuo Shinohara. Uh, is a Japanese architect. is very influential among the Japanese architects that you are pretty much inspired to. Looking at things that are quite miniature and small. Uh, all his all his great project for the 20 years is all small houses, and uh, suddenly when he start to become more well known in bigger projects, then <laughs> you start to realize that's the history that you want to forget. Um, um, but um, in terms of um, yeah, I think this is kind of the major some of the major kind of influence. Uh, definitely uh, influenced the the place where I study as well. I went to study at Cooper Union. Um, basically, uh, um, a lot of my professors were actually not architects, and so that was kind of very influenced. Uh, I studied with Hans Hake. I studied with a, uh, a, a, a judge, Supreme Court judge, and so these kind of things are kind of influenced in case. Um, but s recently, also, I started to find that my influence also have to come really f not within proximity of Asia, but I have to figure out some pieces. Yeah. Thank you for asking some questions. Yes. Information is like a person, like a neo nomada, that is just uh, a cross of cultures. No. Mm -hmm, yes. Uh, here there is some architect that they now uh, they don't have uh, any work for the our situation of yeah. Spain. The, yeah. Our Spanish uh, recession. Uh, uh, ca can you explain to to some of them? What can be the world? Because some of them say, "Oh, I don't know if it's go to travel to China or go to, you know, there is a brick countries that uh, where you can go there mm -hmm. and they can find work in office." And ca can you give to these people that they are, yes, a little, como se dice, desorientado, mm -hmm. desoriented? Yeah. No? yeah, yeah. Which generally, um, there's a, always a history of. Um, um, if you look at the, like Italy, right, people from the south always move to the north to get work. Um, but if you go to the south, you can never taste the food from the north. 
because everybody from the south always bring the food where they migrate, right? So something in here I thought is quite similar. Um, uh, when we're young, we aspire to work in more developed countries, and um, you know, working for major people. Like one, everyone who's gone to London, Madrid, or you know, Barcelona, work for these major places. Um, what's interesting I find is actually working the other way around. Um, finding places where you could have actually much more relationship to those crafts or uh, the people who's also deciding yeah, because it seems like a lot of the there's a lot of building being on but there's not so many um, discussion in that process and I think it probably is the fact that it's actually not going to these major it's going to the places that nobody even consider to develop and uh, I think I think those are kind of the advantage uh, that comes in um, actually, I, I never show you, but I also have um, done five um, my five big projects. Uh, it was an orphan orphanage and a senior citizen home together, combining the two together. It was the first prototype project in China. Um, but exactly, one of my her career was actually started in places where nobody knows where the map is, and um, and I think if you could figure out a way to cultivate that and come back, I think that's something I think might more probably more interesting that way. Um, as opposed to going, you know, <laughs> up the hill, it's actually going the other grain. And uh, um, both creativity and also your voice is actually much more heard in that case. So how do you, how, I'm thinking, those are always things that um, you don't necessarily need to work for the masters. Right? That's why question X story comes in. It's like how do you work in the things that actually could be much more more you can work more hands in hands with. That's what I'm trying to do, do is that also I'm also trying to take um, project where the client don't expect what you're gonna do. So you have discussion and the project start to change. And I think that's probably a certain project comes in is actually uh, um, it's also changing the the original intention. Don't stick with the original intention what they asked for, but how do you change that? And I think that was a very important part of my um, my experience in this process. How do you get somebody doing something else? Um, that's why um, one of the most projects also how to how to keep a certain singular voice in, into the work. Um, we don't. Uh, we could have opportunity to design many projects, but I decided also not to because also um, it was many times I don't even want to look at those projects anymore. Meaning that I spent like a couple months and I don't even want to even show that project. So decided to maybe just focus on certain things and and not worrying about the scale in cases and yeah that's that's very very, very crucial case. Oh, oh. Okay. I'm sorry you need to have the microphone <laughs> uh, yes uh, how does it look like when an architect works with a musician? Um, um, first, we have to know we could drink a lot together. <laughs> um, and many, many part because uh, uh, when I was in, uh, I met these two composer uh, at the at the American Academy. Both won the Rome Prize, uh, and, um, and one of them was a shortlist for a Pulitzer Prize for his music. Both actually, both composer actually writes for uh, write for buildings, music for building. And I thought that was very interesting. And he actually wrote some some build uh, for chapels that he was shortlist for the post uh, the Pulitzer Prize. Uh, and uh, another one he wrote for uh, based on plans. So I think there's quite things are quite similar. Um, but what what I'm interested in is actually the working. How do you get the working process, not at the end result? Um, uh, I think right now I'm also thinking about working possibly with another uh, uh, German. Uh, Artist, also a DJ, uh, Carson Nikolai, on the project. Um, the project is actually it doesn't want to scale this. It's like how to get people excited in tiny little miniature things, because they realize that it doesn't take that much of a relationship. Um, that other questions. That, um, yeah, I think it's, uh, I, it's a particular type of composer. He's not a traditional composers uh, that does um, classical music. Um, it's really funny because uh, he, uh, the client was very happy when I said that uh, I was going to work with a composer, and um, and I said, oh, he's a, he, you know, he studied with here this and these, 
but he thought it was actually more classical these composers and uh, when they did the performance it's really funny the composer was gonna come up and he listened to his music he said uh, I think I better leave because the composer is gonna come I have nothing to say to him because he does not because basically the music is kind of like Ooh, uh, it, it's, it's not your typical project so um, when, when it comes in um, and also I probably will not work very well with traditional composer work. So um, usually, you know, if people were doing projects quite 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 different and similar tastes, and more of like matching aligning personalities. Yeah, I think, yeah. Uh, I, I think our friendship span over eight years, uh, but uh, most of the time uh, we always trying to figure out what projects to work. On. Like the first project with the museum with the one heart speakers, that was his project. We worked together on that project. So we're gonna work on another project. Uh, next project I'm gonna work on it with a uh, with a Chinese opera. Uh, is a is a pretty well known Singaporean artist who who dressed up as a woman, as a man as a woman. He's designed opera and it's gonna be based on Andrea Tarkovsky's Solaris projects. So, and it's, you know, I think this yeah, sort of how it goes is <laughs> yeah. I think what what are basing that. Uh, there's basically there's no market or trend. That that's where I'm really at. <laughs> where there's no there's no that, um, big directions. Thank you. Um, actually, I mean not really. I think uh, at first I thought it was right, but uh, what was interesting was actually um, how to isolate other things that you don't really need, um, and then trying to figure out exactly what sort of um, conversation of culture. Uh, in a, a lot of Chinese emperors used to collect a lot of tiny furnitures. They make into the model. They collect and play games. Uh, and they also think about the history of the uh, foible block. Uh, is to imagine what uh, these little blocks could be of buildings. Uh, kindergarten was invented by a person who studied architecture. And uh, he trains a forester, study architecture, south of Swiss, uh, south of Germany. And then we went back to to uh, to, um, to education. Um, so it's certain aspects of that, yeah. I think, yeah. I th why was also thing is right now is that after we did the project was also the exhibition time. Uh, we start to realize China young architect has a different view now. And it's no longer say Japan and China history. They're interesting by the ideas. And they also start to realize that when uh, this architect called Shinohara was talking about what was happening in Japan during the 70s, China is actually has a big show of a Japanese architect in China. And people, I've never seen an architecture exhibition with so many people. And these are younger people. And uh, so I thought this is actually probably a direction that we, I think, I'd like to, like to do, harness and develop. Um, have this, and uh, you know, between them, like a miniaturization and monuments, and, um, and also trying to figure out what other who other people and what fields are talking about this. Mm. Oh. Um, it seems like you're working on like a very unique junction between art, architecture, and like curatorship. I was just wondering, like, what your opinion is on like the relationship between these disciplines. Do you see them as like different disciplines that like you're an architect that does curating work or like an architect that does like artwork or do you see them as like one like um, kind of holistic discipline and like how you approach your projects if it is that way. Yeah, um, I, 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 I tend to sort of approach the whole project all three lines together. Uh, when we carried this project, actually, I was designing some of the projects because I realized that uh, curing is not just telling people what to do, but also take the initiative and just do it. We don't have a contract to do it. I just designed it because I had to make sure that it organized based on a certain idea. And we just run through it. And, um, and of course, uh, I teach at the university, which is more a traditional architecture school. It said that I'm doing the uh, the they couldn't figure out what I'm doing. 
they just didn't realize and do many things, right? Just don't care. But in the art world, I would say that, oh, his architecture was interesting in uh, art. Um, but I think that's, um, I was, yeah, I couldn't, I couldn't really, yeah, I would say that um, I haven't got a chance to uh, really divide into pieces, but what I realized is actually not just disciplines, but actually exactly what sort of uh, message we want to get across. I mean, I think right now it's actually idea, this kind of idea of con condensing process. How can we use that as a, as a theme? And I'm trying to figure out a way to, if I, it requires me to do a curating, I'll do that to get that idea across. If I need to do architecture, I need to do that. So in, in creating a miniature museum, I designed it in a way that I have to make sure that buildings still continue. I, I just volunteer myself as a curator with no, no contractual issues. I said, I'll just tell them, I'm just going to run it for the next couple of years. Um, that's, that's how it kind of rolls here. But it's also probably interesting to look at the history of the uh, curating. Right? It's actually it's trying to get away, ourselves away from institutions, right? not, not within uh, something. And uh, what's interesting is that this, uh, the curating of history is really about thematic interests. So it's not focused on methods, it's not focused on uh, sort of discipline, but focus on uh, what sort of thematic interests in here. So when we get projects, we, we don't generally say, oh, somebody asked us to do a canteen's opera or something here. But we already have something in, in our mind that we want, okay, we interject it back again. So in other words, I, I think uh, a lot of issues right now, I'm looking at a lot of people in this similar discipline, is that everything changed all the time. So they're just basically taking commission and they just based on clients need. Uh, I wonder if it's possible to do kind of the, uh, with quite autonomously. Mm. Yes. Uh, I really want to speak Chinese to, with you, but now I need to finish my question. And my question uh, maybe uh, is not very related to your lecture, but it's really a, a question that confused me for a long time. Uh, like uh, the situation in during the Chinese students now is like in 10 Chinese students, maybe six want to go to America to uh, to learn further uh, to more education and maybe two go to Europe and the last uh, one is preparing mm -hmm. and uh, so and with the winner winning of uh, Wang Shu uh, this confusion for me is more stronger mm -hmm. and so my question is uh, and also for me and the projects the projects of architects differs uh, because of they had the different reference, different different references in their mind, and the reference references uh, are not just a project, maybe some uh, experience, something. And for me, uh, how I want to ask, how can we, how can I find uh, more my identity? If you have, if I, if you have a little bit international background background can you give me some suggestion mm -hmm. yeah yeah this this um this seems to be the case um um i have a lot of um um i i te uh, i teach both the undergraduate and graduate program at hong kong u i find that the undergraduate is the most strongest because the idea is more 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 discipline and direct, and the graduate students uh, usually kind of have different type of issues in here. But um, but what I explain is that um, um, when Wang Shu won the uh, Pritzker Prize, right? Um, because the the art school at the China Academy, they always considered as the art school. It's not really the real architecture school. People should go to the main school, like the top six schools, like Tsinghua and such. Right? But now since he won, so his um, student trying to get into the school is three times harder now. It's like 100 students apply, only one gets in. And this 100 have to be trained in the art area. So um, the question is, if it comes in, you're saying that I see a lot of architect, young architects, they work for different. You can see, uh, you know, they might work for Peter Zumpor, but then they, they work for Ramco Haas. <laughs> These are two different fields, right? It's, uh, and then you could work for uh, something in here. Um, 
and also, I think it's much harder to find your own voice because, I mean, being in, saying in the context of a Chinese student in China, is that there everybody is are as ambitious as you are the next person, right? and um, so what I find is that um, I, I don't know it's, it's quite a difficult question to, uh, to ask because I I don't know exactly where what what sort of uh, interests like I think one of the things like we're asking is like what who who really influences you. Right? Um, but um, I, I see that, like a lot of great students that came in, and then um, you know I thought they were complete potentials. And then when they s graduate top class and they work for something more, and I start to realize that uh, eventually they, they they made a choice already, right? that they do architecture by as a, as a discipline, interest, or as a, or uh, architecture as a profession. And I think that's something that I think one should kind of address. So the fact that the the architecture in China is treated as a profession, and uh, and, he's, and that's why he found that the disappointment is the fact that um, previously architect was basically somebody you just work with you know, craftsmen and say it's not about logistics and so it's quite new. He said that his basically his uh, the grandfather of his you know, grand teacher in that case was only the first generation that witnessed architecture as a profession. And uh, um, but I, I was saying that I, I think all of us should do architecture for personal reasons, <laughs> not not as a career reason. And so um, I, th I think that's one one, uh, one one thing to look look at. But of course, uh, um, I always had my uh, my my my, uh, my head head of my school always remind tell us that we also need people to work in the field, <laughs> cat monkeys or something, right? In that case. Um, I, I, I'm not sure if I agree with in that sense because uh, I, I think um, I think training architecture is, is good, probably good knowledge, great construction knowledge, but um, but maybe in the field I think it has discrepancies in here. But the question is like, do you want to go back to in China? So I, I think that's I think that's a more important question because that could answer what you want to do. Because it's a different type of survival, right? Right. You you stay here. You know, you, you, architecture is it's different questions, and maybe it's not even architecture questions. It's just your personal questions. Uh, I remember when I finished my studies in in Spain, I came back to my city, a small city called Ceuta in the North Africa. And in that moment, there was a, a, a Portuguese architect called Alvaro Siza working in my, my city. Mm -hmm. So I asked my, myself what I'm doing here. There are not a lot of architects that are not interested at all about architecture. And I have the opportunity to work with a great architect. So I met him several times. And once I asked him, what if I'm coming with you to Oporto to work with you? So he told me, if you want to come with me, you can. But if you want to learn, you have to do what I have uh, done. You have to travel. Everything I have learned, it wasn't with another architect, but just traveling and, of course, being curious. Because if you are curious, you are going to, to learn a lot of things, and maybe the architecture as a profession is going to be just an excuse to work in another country or to learn about other culture. And I think that's what Fernand is doing and a lot of people are doing now. Uh, I don't know if we can tell that we are architects, yeah. just architects. Maybe, first of all, we are personal. This is interesting. Um, there was a thing that was, I, I definitely don't agree with. Peter, Peter Eisenman, he also taught at the same school. Um, he said that it's very interesting that uh, in the 70s and 80s, people were thinking about the grand tour. You travel, it's to see artifacts and see this. But the, the new trend right, is not, not to see buildings, it's actually work in different offices. It doesn't differ, it's a new grand tour in that case. So, <clears throat> so you get a lot of people who say, oh, you know, work here and there. <clears throat> but the, the, what I find is that, that there's a 
I think I think there's a travel is like the probably run into this similar travel is actually see things in front of you, right in front of you, and make your own readings of it, as opposed to working one who translate for you. Well, it's interesting to talk about that here, huh? <laughs> because it, it seems like this is the destination. <laughs> it's, it's not. It's not something you get out. It's actually this is people want to be here. Actually, I, like I said, I wrote this letter and never arrived. <laughs> as I, as I said. <laughs> yeah, actually, I wrote to two people. I said this guy from Barcelona, Ant Antonio Samatin. But then I, I didn't work. I, somebody told me my friend who works is a butcher. But he was doing his PhD on Santa Maria in Barcelona. He's a butcher uh, in the summer, but he's doing his PhD. In, uh, so we had this house that somebody, some grandma didn't want to live. We fixed it and we stayed in Barceloneta. But my, my, that was my destiny was to actually go south. <laughs> never, never, never arrive. But it took a while, but yeah. <laughs> When I came here, I thought I was in Germany because it was raining. <laughs> at the only at the airport, <laughs> it only rains in this valley of airport. I was like, I, th I thought I um I should bring more clothes <laughs> because it was pretty cold. <laughs> I thought maybe it was all the maybe the, everybody from Germany who just arrived was bringing the weather here, <laughs> or maybe England. <laughs> But what's interesting is that after this, I'm actually going to go to Romania and spend seven days on a bus with a group of people that I never don't know. We were selected to go on this on, the, on this trip. But what's another interesting is actually that Eastern Europe. <laughs> there was a case. It was really funny because I had I told friends I'm coming to Eastern Europe. I thought most people want to leave Romania, and not to, not to go there. So I think that's another pretty interesting thing. It's actually looking for the places that. There is no architecture. So. Well, anyhow, you can still have a whole afternoon of fabulous talks. <laughs> so I, don't <laughs> um, I guess that's good. But thank you very much. You guys have been a candid audience. <laughs>